this Sunday was okay before checking with my wife, which is why she's not here. Don't recommend doing that. <laughs> uh, she, we, our small group is having a Thanksgiving lunch today. She has a big part of that, and she's cooking it and stressing out about the food. And really wanted me to reschedule, but um, yeah. sometimes I think the Lord has a plan, and, and I'm here. She, she sends her regards and her thanks, but she wishes she could. Uh, I did. I, I got a um, support um, offering from you guys recently, and, and man, God just moved my heart. And um, it was at a time in the month that needs needed to be met, and were not going to be met unless that came in. And it came in, and God just moved my heart to, to express thanks. Uh, I didn't know what that looked like. I, I, my first thought was not up here. It was, hey, let's write him a letter. Uh, let's something like that, and Jeff's like, you know what, here's your opportunity to, to tell him thank you. Um, so that's that's why I'm up here. Um, before that, God's put on my heart some things um, that I've just been battling with the last two weeks, and I feel like God wants me to get that out, um, and, and I know that when God does that, you better listen. At least in my situation, I would say in yours. So if y'all would allow me, there's a word that God's put in my heart. I'm really going to try to hammer it out. I know we're, we're short, but I'm going to get it out. Um, so would you guys like to hear a word from the Lord? Yeah. 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 Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your son. God, uh, thank you for waking us up and giving us breath this morning. I pray that you speak through me. I pray that I deliver this that pleases you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the word that I feel, and, I, and if you were here Wednesday, you heard me touch on it. I actually touched on it in class at the lodge on Tuesday. The week before that, it was just battling with me. But the word that I feel like is, is discussing troublesome seasons. And I think there's some people in here that are supposed to hear this. Uh, we go through troublesome seasons. We go through hard times. And... Um, what confirmed it, that I just knew, all right, God, I, I hear you, finally I hear you, was not too long ago a man came to me and was discussing the troublesome season. Um, he was telling me that things were going good. He was feeling God's presence. He was in the Word. He was, everything was going great. And then a wall. A wall. He no longer felt that. He no longer felt the presence of God. And he said, I'm still doing the things that I was doing. What's me? Am I doing something wrong? And the thing that confirmed it was he thought he was the only one that felt this way. I felt that way. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a wall. And I can't explain it. Sometimes you're going through life, you're doing the right things. You know how when you're on fire and you know just God is right there, and He's writing the words for you. And then there's times it's not. It's like the, the famous painting. A poem about the footsteps in the sand and the times you hearing this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my advice was, was, was this. Wait on the Lord. Um, and, and reoccurring in the Bible, we always hear is wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And that's not fun. That's, that's really, really tough. Um, I can't explain why this, those seasons happen, why that feeling happens with God, but I can say I got the feeling during those times that maybe God's looking down when He's not carrying me, when He's letting me walk among my feet, and He's wondering if I'll still be faithful to get His Word, to have a, a faithful prayer life. I wonder if He's seeing during that time that He's kind of letting me go and I'm not feeling that presence, if He's going to see if I'm going to be a faithful follower. That's not biblical. That's con conjecture. That's what I think. Uh, I think that's, that's what I feel when I, when I go through those seasons. But waiting on the Lord is, is scripture. Um, how do you do that? Man, you take one step at a time. You, uh, Matt Chandler said, you position yourself under the waterfall of grace. And you just work in obedience. Wait on the Lord. Why do we wait on the Lord? The Bible also tells us if you wait on the Lord, you need strength. You need strength. Be up on wings like eagles. You'll, you'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not grow faint. That's why you went on the Lord. Um, so these seasons, and, and what I mentioned Wednesday was, man, just Paul and Romans, James and James, and then Peter in First Peter talks about 
we're going to go through these seasons. And there's a reason. You persevere. It grows your faith. It grows your strength. And it kind of made sense the other night when I was talking to this man that we're going to go through seasons. Bad seasons. Tough seasons. Rough seasons. Financial tough seasons. You should have gotten a promotion at work when someone else did seasons. When your kids aren't acting right. When your spouse and you are going through a tough season. There's seasons in life. And even the, the New Testament authors do that. They do that. I just wanted to give a quick example of an Old Testament season to try to maybe how we can apply this, how we can see how a tough season could benefit us. Because no one during the season looks like, oh, God's molding me right here. Um, oh, God's going to do this in my life. No one does that if you're going through those. Uh, Moses, you know the story of Moses. Um, I think the biggest part of the season aspect of Moses' life that we overlook is he was raised in the Pharaoh's house. Royalty. Egypt was a, the most powerful force in the world. He was raised as royalty. The Pharaoh's daughter got him out of the Nile River. Um, so what does that look like? He was probably primpered. He was probably, his bed was made for him. He probably had fresh fruits brought to him, bathed perhaps. And then he kills a man. And then he goes in the wilderness for 40 years. He goes in the wilderness for 40 years. Now thinking back, if he was primitive, does he know how, does he know survival skills? Does he know what plants in the wilderness to eat to stay alive? Does he know how to gather water in the desert? I mean, does he know these things? What did Moses do later on in life? He led the Israel, the Hebrews, out of Egypt. I challenge you, I don't have time, I challenge you, look back at that story and look at the route that the, the people went. And God sent Moses to take the people out of, it, out of Egypt. Look at the route. See if it's similar to the season of life that Moses went through when he killed a man in Egypt and had to run for his life. He went through that tough season. And he worked for his father. Anybody else have to do that? That's tough. That's not a good thing. That's a tough season. <laughs> I've had to do that. Um, so he had to learn those things in that tough season of life before God used him to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, the last thing I want to touch on this season is John 16, 33. Um, if you want to turn there. I don't know if you have it. I have it right here. This is Jesus talking. And this is powerful. We're left to soak in. This is powerful. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. Every version you can look up is going to say the word will. Not might, not you could. You will have tribulations while you live in this world. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Oh, man. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Briefly, I just want to encourage you. If you're going through a season, take heart. Take heart. Uh, now, why I'm up here. I want to talk to you about Thanksgiving and how I'm thankful. Um, Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says this, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at, this, at His appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God or Savior. Oh, that we as the body of Christ see this verse in your faith. We see this verse and we see that God does not lie. God is faithful to keep his promises. I'm thankful for the only work of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that God allowed me to go through seasons, gut riching seasons. I'm thankful that God protected me during those seasons to an extent that I may never know. I was involved in things that I probably shouldn't be here. I might not ever know how God protected me, but I know He did. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God wooed me, and once I surrendered to Jesus, He grabbed me from the, from the jaws of heaven. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for God for giving me a wife who loves God more than she loves me. And that she stuck with me through those gut-wrenching seasons. 
I'm thankful for Spring to Life Ministry that showed me Jesus like I've never seen. And they have a boldness to tell me about freedom in Christ and not the hate of my education. Now I say those things because those are dear to my heart and this next little bit is as important as the things that I'm thankful for and I want you to hear this. I'm thankful for Pleasant View Baptist Church. I'm thankful for almost two years ago my wife and I were put on a prayer list praying for restoration of my marriage. And was ending in divorce. And we know it out from the divorce. And we right down on a prayer list almost two years ago pray for restoration. Oh, yeah. I'm thankful that here prayer is still high in the James chapter 5 verse 16 says this the prayer of a righteous person is a powerful and effective thing <clears throat> good news, bad news, bad news no one in here in their own will is righteous good news a lot of people in here are imputed righteous that's right that's right, right. And he hears our prayers in the Bible. God's Word tells us that wow, yeah. Thank you for believing that. Thank you for doing that. I'm thankful that when I bring these men here, I know that the truth is going to be preached. I'm thankful that when we come here, when I came here, there's open arms. There's no judging. There's open arms and there's love felt as we walk in the world. I'm thankful for that. I thank you for the continuous amount of support as I talked about ends being met because of this church. Yeah. I thank you for believing in me as a local missionary. I thank you for believing in my mission, this free life's mission, of seeing men walk in freedom from a tool that the enemy's using this day and age, and that's called addiction. The enemy's using that tool rapidly right now. I thank you for supporting that. Freedom. Who the sun sets free is free in you. I would like you to give yourselves a hand and give your pastor a hand as it comes up. Thank you. Give thanks 
always unto God. For all things, you're supposed to give thanks. You know, and what it's telling us there is, is that uh, it's not necessarily uh, the place we find ourselves in when we're giving thanks. What I mean by that, I heard a guy say one time, well, when we're talking to God and we're thankful, should we stand, sit, or kneel? You know, should we, should we stand up and say, oh God, I'm so thankful? Or should we fall down on our face and say, oh God, I'm so thankful? Or should we just sit there and, oh God, oh, I'm so thankful? Because you know what? We think about Thanksgiving, we think about a lot of times about our prayers. And that the only way that we express thanks is by audibly speaking to God and saying, God, this is what I'm thankful for. And then we rattle off our list of what we're thankful for. But the thing is, is it's not so much about the place you find yourself in, or, or the posture, I want to talk about the posture of Thanksgiving today, but I'm not talking about position physically, I'm talking about a condition of the heart. Because let me tell you something, friends, if our hearts are right toward God, then this Thanksgiving thing, the fact that we ought to be grateful for the things that God has given us, it comes naturally, it comes with the territory. It is an attitude of gratefulness. See, what happens is, friends, us to be thankful toward God, it's actually a matter of, of the evidence being brought forth in our life of thankfulness. And we're going to talk about that next week. That's the final message in this series, the evidence of our thankfulness. But as we look at the posture of thanksgiving this morning, it is driven by humbleness of heart. You know, I just said that the object of our gratitude is God, but we have to realize it's not dependent upon us or what we've done or what somebody can give us. Listen, it, 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 you have to have humility in order to understand that you don't have anything apart from God. Right. Right. I mean, you have to put yourself below God, right? See, that's the problem with a lot of people. They're God in their life. You know why they worry about what, where the money's going to come from and, and, and how, how they're going to make ends meet, what's going to happen? Because they don't have their dependence in the God, the one true God who made this whole earth, who gave us everything. They're their God, and so they're trusting in themselves to supply their needs. Yet God says, I'll supply the need. See, that's the problem. We get ourselves in the wrong place. There's a billboard out right now. There's wristbands and all this stuff about I am second, you know. You gotta be second. Right. Yeah. I'll tell you what, when it comes to, to God, you're second. When it comes to your family, you need to be second. Your family needs to be before you. You know, that's the heart of Christ. He, he took upon himself the form of a servant, made the likeness of men. He, he, was, he was God in heaven, and he wrapped himself in flesh and came down here for us. He placed himself second so that we could have eternal life. Right. We learn humbleness of heart from our Savior. Do you know, for us to have humbleness of heart, we have to reach the place in our life where we realize that without God giving it, we don't have anything to begin with. Matter of fact, Paul wrote it like this. He said, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. He said, Be careful for nothing. Now that's being anxious. That's being self-reliant. That's being worrisome. See, when you become self-reliant and you're not humble enough to recognize that all things are from God, you enter into this place of worry and fearfulness. Uh, when you have failed to trust God and you put yourself in a place and say, well, I'm going to take care of this. Listen, we have to reach the place in our lives where it's if God wills, we'll do this or that. If God wants that for my life, if I'm to have that in my life, then it's going to have to be because God willed it to be. You have to move to a place where uh, you trust God so much that as He guides and He provides, then you're able to show your gratitude to Him. See, this posture of thanksgiving is rooted in humility. Uh, it's not just about what you have. Though. A lot of times when we think about thankfulness, if, you, if I asked you as I did last or two weeks ago to, to think of the top five things you're thankful for, a lot of that stuff would be things, might be people in your life. Tangible, right? That you can get a hold of. But it's not just about what you have or who's in your life. It's also about who you are. Listen, because... You are anything apart from God. We're dust. Right. We're sinful flesh apart from God. We're separated. We're sinners, hell-bound sinners apart 
from the forgiveness and grace of God Almighty. Amen. So without God, it's not just about what we have, it's about who we need to be. Matthew Henry one time, and he, he kept a journal uh, throughout his life. He's a great theologian. You may not know that name. It's okay. All right? He's actually so smart that uh, I, I don't need to read him much anymore because I don't understand what he's talking about. He's up to you. Okay? But, he, but he's got a lot of good stuff. And he kept a personal journal and stuff. And, and at one point in his life, he was robbed. And you know what he said? Uh, he said this as he wrote this journal after he'd been robbed. He said, let me be thankful first that I was never robbed before. Now how many of us, if we were in that situation, would say that? Wouldn't say, let me be thankful first that I've not been robbed. Like, God, why did I get robbed? What's the problem? He didn't stop there. Though. Listen to what he said. Let me first be thankful that I was never robbed before. Second, that although they took my purse... They did not take my life. And then, even though they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, and not I who robbed. So let me be thankful. See, when you begin to realize, when you open your heart, you realize, wow, God, I am what I am because of your grace and because of who you are. Then you can really begin to express thanksgiving. But it doesn't just stop there. The, the second thing we find that as we, in, in this posture of thanksgiving, in this, this condition of the heart, is that the posture of thanksgiving, that it's manifested in our worship. Manifested in our worship. Now, what do you think of when you think about worship? What we just did, right? Woo! Praise the Lord. Jesus loving my soul. I like the music, okay? I like music. I like to worship the Lord. I like to sing praises to, to Him. But here's the thing. It's not just all about that. See, this is what the psalmist said. Psalms 116, verse 7. He said, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Now, there's, there's many ways. We, we might give Him praise through prayer. Till I met Melissa's family, till her dad came to be our pastor at Dowtown in 2001 when I was just 15 years old. Uh, you know, I never heard anybody start a prayer with, Lord, we love You and we praise You. I've never heard anybody say that. I've never heard anybody give worth to God's name. I've always heard people pray and ask God for things you know, what we want, we, and we do that a lot of times. We treat God like a drive through at McDonald's and we order up our prayers and then we amen and we're off to our lives. But, but, but I never heard anybody take time to say, God, I just want to reverence your name. Well, Jeff, you ain't never heard nobody pray before. Well, I've never heard him say, Dear Heavenly Father. And then here come the requests. But I never heard anybody take time and say, Lord, we love you and we praise you. And, and I realized, you know, hey, I can call upon him and I can praise him. I can worship him as, as we think about worship. I can sing songs of praise him. And listen, I'm just going to be honest with you. Whether you like the kind of music that gets sung any given Sunday, whether it's your flavor or not, hey, you're not here because of the music that's being played. You're here because somebody died in your place and you want to give him praise and honor and glory and lift up his name. Right. So it doesn't matter whether it's my favorite song. I mean, I love the old hymns. Hello? Can I get a witness? Yeah, yeah okay, I knew I could. But the same thing, I could say, I love some of this new music too. A lot of our young people say, Amen, I love this new music. You know what it is? It's not about the style, it's about what we're saying about Him and to Him. Yeah. I want to bring Him praise and honor and glory. See what worship becomes when our attitude about being thankful towards God is right. What happens is this. It doesn't matter what my preference is. It matters that my desire is to bring Him praise. It becomes a sacrifice of my heart. Becomes a, my praise becomes a sacrifice. So that's what I would do because I didn't like it. No. You, it becomes a sacrifice because you're giving of yourself. Hey, God called me to preach because I can't sing. Oh. It's embarrassing. You know? I mean, I'm glad I married a wife that can sing. Hallelujah. You know? And uh, 
you know, she's my other half where I'm weak, she's strong. Yeah. You know? Hello? But uh, but but you know what? I don't worry about that when we're in here. You'll hear me a lot of Sundays over here just singing and busting out loud the song. Oh. You know why? Because I don't care what you think. I'm not singing to you. I'm singing to him. I'm singing to the one who died for me. I'm singing to the one who cared enough about me though I wasn't worthy to be saying he loved me anyway. Well, hey. oh, Brother Jeff, you're just busting our own idea, aren't you? No, I just want you to understand that it is all, worship is all about magnifying him, giving him worth. See, when we worship, we're adding worth to his name. He, he's got glory. The Lord will get himself glory. The Bible's clear about that. You can sit on your blessed assurance the rest of your life and God will give himself glory. Do you hear me? He will. But what you have the opportunity to do, and I have the opportunity to do, is to worship him and to add worth to his name. To add worth to, uh, to, to bring him greater fame. I knew that right. this is all about fame. It ain't about my fame. It's about his fame. Right. Because of what he's done. You know, it's kind of like John said. He said, I, I, got, I, I have to decrease so that he can increase. That's really what we're doing in worship. We're saying, Lord, apart from you, I am nothing. Apart from you, I am nothing. See, but here's, here, here's the... Here's the thing. We're talking about the posture of thanksgiving and that it's conditioned by heart. If your heart's not right, listen folks, you cannot worship God the way you should. Or even the way you might want to. Here's what the psalmist said. Psalms 107, 22 said, And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And watch what it says though. And declare His works with rejoicing. Brother Adam just talked about troublesome times. How hard is it in the midst of a storm? Or in the midst of a dry season, which is one of the things he mentioned, running up against the wall. How hard is it to praise the Lord? How hard is it to magnify His name when you don't really feel all that close to Him anyway? <clears throat> See, friends, what happens is, is we run into these dry seasons and what the devil attempts to in those dry seasons is to make sure that you don't regain your joy. Because if he, if he steals your joy, then what can you not do? You cannot praise God the way you want to or even should. Because it said, let them declare His works with rejoicing. I'm telling you something. When you walk into a church house, there ought not be this. Well. Like people been weaned on lemon juice. <laughs> permanent scowl written across their face. Listen, the joy of the Lord should inhabit His people. And what happens is the devil wants to rob that joy because you can't praise the Lord the way you want to. You can't, dis you can't show that uh, faith or that grateful heart that you ought to have if you're all you're worried about is your sin and your circumstance. Right. You get focused on all that stuff and you, you forget trying to praise the Lord. Because at that moment, those people who are, who, are, who are struggling with those things, they're being controlled by that. And so they find themselves unable to give Him the praise that they would that they would do otherwise. See, but when we're focused on the object of our thanksgiving and we've humbled our heart before God, then we're able to manifest this thankfulness in our worship. See, I'm always careful about this. Most, most pastors are, for the most part, careful about this. You know, people tell me a lot of times, oh, that was a good message, or, or oh, you know, it's such a blessing. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate that. I really do. I appreciate it. It's encouraging words to me. It lets me know that it resonated with you, whatever. Now, granted, you don't come tell me when you think it was a dud. No. Not most of the time. But, but we may give praise to people sometimes. You know, you may, you may give praise, you know, oh, preacher, it's a good ministry. Or, you know, we give praise to athletes sometimes because of their athletic ability. Or we, we give praise to somebody because they did a good job on something, you know. Or we give praise. You know, we, we said that, oh, we're just so thankful. You know, and I said it earlier about what's going on next door. And, you know, we're thankful for these things. And some people say, well, you're not going to do that. Ain't one worthy. Listen, there's praise. There's higher praise. And there's highest praise. 
And my highest praise is reserved for Him. <laughs> my highest praise... Uh, you might get a hand clap down here for something you do, but my highest praise, in other words, from the depths of my heart that I am thankful, all of that is reserved for God. And when we put ourselves in the place where we understand that we have to have humbleness of heart, when we have the object of our gratitude in the right place, and when we're allowing it to, to manifest itself in our worship, then He receives our highest praise. Because at that point, we are truly bringing Him glory. And that should be our whole goal, is to bring Him glory. See, because he, he, He's done the, the greatest thing He can do for any of us, in that He loved us. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love Him because He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. See, when you recognize that great love has been shown to you, then out of a grateful heart you return that love. See, a lot of times, unfortunately, love today has just become empty words. I love you. We do it to each other. But unfortunately, we also do it in church. We may say we love God, but is there evidence? And we'll get more into this next week. Is there evidence of our love? Is there evidence of that gratefulness of what God has done for us? See, it has to be more than just empty words. See, it's fact. We're drawn to Him because of His love for us. That's what that says. We love Him because He first loved us. We didn't have no reason to want God. We had rebelled against God. Right. We didn't have no reason to go back. We, we, we were separated and we were, we were undone. We couldn't get back to Him. And so we're just off living our lives. But God, who is rich in mercy and love, what did He do? He came to us when we could not go to Him. And so it's that great love that He demonstrated first that causes us to respond and react to Him. See, it's because of His love that we're willing to serve Him. Serve. I ain't talking just about preaching either. I'm talking about working for Him and telling other people about Him. Yeah. To give to Him. Yes, one of the ways we worship Him and let Him know our gratefulness is we give to Him and what He's doing to His kingdom work. Another way is to let others know all that He's done in our life. We demonstrate our love. But you know what? Here's the mistake we make in Thanksgiving a lot of times. Because it's just, it's not about that major event. We go back to Calvary and know how much He loved us and what He's done for us. Here's what happens. Our motivation many times is what are we receiving? And then if we're not receiving, then guess what? We're not as grateful. If we're not receiving, then it changes the extent of our gratefulness. Let's just be honest. If the benefits ceased, because there are benefits to knowing God, amen? Yeah. But if the benefits ceased, how honest, let's be honest, how, how thankful would we be Here's the truth. If God never gave us another thing, all that He's offered in and through Christ is enough. Is enough reason that He should be the object of our gratitude? Is enough reason that we ought to humble ourselves before Him? Is enough reason that we ought to give Him praise and honor and glory? That itself is enough. Because the ultimate price was paid by God for Jesus Christ for our sins. The forgiveness of our sins was paid by innocent blood. The blood that washes away our sin. That's enough. You know what? I'm preaching to myself here. Don't misunderstand me, okay?
Do you remember the joy that filled you at that moment when you knew that God had forgiven you? That He wiped away your sins? Do you remember how thankful you were at that very moment that He'd done that? That, that even though you didn't deserve it, He did that for you? I do. But let's be honest. We've driven down the road a little ways from that experience. And we're not as thankful as we used to be. Not as thankful as the night when He found us. See, here's the thing, folks. We still ought to be humbled by it. I'm not saying that, that you can't sing I'm a child of the one true king. And be proud of that. But I'm saying it still ought to humble our hearts to know that the God of heaven didn't give up on us. And He came to us in our hour of need. And He saved us. And He's worthy of our worship because of it. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Listen, you may not be able to find a lot of things to be thankful for in your life today, but one thing that you can say, I'm thankful for is this. But there might be somebody here this morning that, to be honest with you, if you were honest with God right now, and honest with us, to be honest with you, you would say this, I don't know that. I don't understand that, that, that God loved me. Well, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. You've not run too far away that you can't come to Him. You've not done something so bad that He doesn't want you. Because guess what? He knew you. And He knew everything you'd ever do. And He loved you anyway. He loved you. He loved me anyway. Brother Gary Miller said when he was here during our revival just recently, he said, if you knew every thought since he'd been saved that it would pass through his brain, you'd never want to be around him again. Hello? If you knew every thought that ever passed through my brain, in my life, or even since I've been saved, you wouldn't want to be around me either. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that nobody in this building can claim to be the chief sinner. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have measure of it. But in Christ, that's my righteousness. It's not of myself. I can't stand up here and boast. I'm such a good person. I am what I am because of what He's done in my life. And He wants to do that for every person if they just say, Lord, I need you in my life. But you have to humble your heart before Him and be willing to receive Him. He won't force it out. That's not the kind of God He is. He's a God that gave a free choice. And you can choose Him or you reject Him. But you have to live with the consequences if you reject Him. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all across this altar.